What's the word, y'all? Welcome back to Call Gang, Kenny Frill, whatever you want to call it, man. The last 30 to 35 hours in the NBA world have been ridiculous, and I'm here to talk about it. Before we do that, here's some housekeeping things. Um, I won't be able to post an episode of the Call Game recap over the next couple days because I have a work trip. I will be going to L.A. to film some things, and because of that, I won't be able to do these recaps. I mean, unless something ridiculous happens. If something ridiculous happens, I, I will almost have my phone, and I will do a selfie style, but that's only on extreme circumstances, big trades or whatever. My trip to L.A. is related to this thing i told y'all the call game is expanding and when i'm in la we're filming with nba players that's all i'm saying that's all i'm really saying i won't give away anything else but i'm filming with nba players and um every time i'm next to an nba player i realize how short i really am i'm i'm, I'm clocked in at like five seven but when you're standing next to somebody that's an nba that's six 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 seven you really i picked the wrong profession to be in basically because of my height anyway i want to talk about this last 30 to 35 hours because here are the three major events that happened in the nba that have adam silver probably whoo making calls trying to do damage control so it starts off charles barkley who's supposed to be this component of the nba he's supposed to be a backer an analyst comes out and basically said on national tv in front of everybody he hates the nba right now he hates the product that he has to watch every single night Adam Silver, probably not happy about that. Then the same night, LeBron James calls out the NBA and Adam Silver for, for putting on an, an all-star game when it probably ain't the safest, probably ain't the best for him. And then lastly, today, we had this whole virus thing dealing with Kevin Durant. Uh, Adam Silver is probably doing a lot, and I mean a lot of damage control. I want to focus on today and not really talk about Charles Barkley and, and LeBron's takes. And, and I, I mean, maybe I will eventually, depending on what LeBron decides to do. Because that's a big if. If LeBron decides to sit out, I don't even know what's going to happen. Anyway, let's talk about the Kevin Durant thing. And and everything I'm going to say is my opinion. Because even right now, things are a bit murky. Because I, I don't really understand what the NBA was going. Okay, so this is my understanding of it. So uh, Kevin Durant, they have to lay scratch it because they think he has been in contact with somebody that might have the virus. They aren't sure if the person has the virus, but he might have the vi- they might have the virus. So Kevin Durant, close, close proximity, you're a late game scratch. Makes sense to me. That's being cautious. I think that's what most people would do. Most, most people think is the right idea. But halfway through the first quarter, they're like, you know what, Kevin? We think you good, bro. Go hoop. Go hoop. And they allow him to hoop for a quarter and a half. And they're like, you know what, Kevin? The person that we, you were in contact with does have the virus. Get him out of here. And Kevin Durant calls out the NBA for being fake cautious because at the end of the day, that's what it is. And this is my personal opinion. If somebody has been in contact with somebody that they believe might have the virus, steer on the side of caution and not allow this player to play. But I always have to realize that the NBA is a business. And that's why we will have an all-star game. And that's why Kevin Durant was probably pushed to play a nasty televised game. I wonder if this was Reggie Perry instead of Kevin Durant. If the NBA tackles it a little bit different, because let's be realistic, the average NBA fan, they, they see that Kevin Durant is not playing today, maybe they turn off that game. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't understand what the NBA was thinking, and now Kevin Durant can't travel, even though we don't even know if he does, if he does or doesn't have the virus. He's going to continue to have to test and test and test. Anyway, it's just a weird situation, and let's... Let's get to actual talking about the basketball that was on the court. The Toronto Raptors get a big, and I mean a big time win that propels them from, I think they were the 10th seed going into this, all the way up to the 6th seed. That's how close the race is right now in the Eastern and Western Conference. But it's a really, really big win. Nick Nurse and company had this goal to basically run the zone for a majority of it and not allow these isolation heavy players to isolate at the end of the day. When James Harden had the ball, they sent the W, a double, and, and, James Harden did a great job of finding his teammates and not allowing the, the offense to become stagnant because he was getting double, but the Raptors did not allow him to get off shots. The fact that, I don't know, how, how many shots did he end up with? He ended up with eight shot attempts. Is that an all-time low as far as star James Harden? I'm sure he's done it when he was coming off the bench and stuff, but star James Harden, that is extremely, extremely low, and that is because of the defensive plans from Nick Nurse and the Toronto Raptors. Like I said, this is a very big win for them because they they figured out that they had a matchup nightmare with Pascal Siakam on pretty much being guarded by anybody on the Brooklyn Nets. No matter who he had on his back on that block, he can do his spin move, he can do whatever he needs to do, and he could get them buckets. And there were por- portions of this game where I thought he was going to struggle. Um, I, mean, I, I guess he did struggle missing two to three in a row, but they kept going back to it, and he kept going back to it, and he ended up um, hitting some big, big shots, and he shot nine for 10 from the free throw line, which helps. 
But the big thing here is Cal Lowry. Yes, I said it. Cal Lowry started off the game like one for six, one for seven. And then with Fred Van Vliet also shooting bad, this was like a recipe for a game where the Raptors lose. But Cal Lowry picks it up. He ends up scoring 30. He ends up playmaking. He ends up all over the place offensively and defensively. Now, what people really want to talk about between this game, the Bulls game with the with the Magic, the New Orleans Pelicans, and Indiana Pacers, this was a weird day for officiating, right? Cal Lowry ends up doing his best Nelly impression because he gets hit so hard, his eye starts to bleed. But now that I say that, I'm sure that the majority of the people watching this video don't understand the Nelly reference because y'all are, be, are young, bro. I realize that a lot of people watching these videos are actually really young. You're really young. But anyway, the officiating, is, this is my take on officiating. At the end of the day, it is a man-made job, and because of that, they have eyes like us, right? So there will be missed calls. There will be phantom calls. But my only complaint about it, because I know that – well, at the end of the day, some games will be lost to officiating. It's just the way it is. As long as it is a man-made job, some games will be lost to officiating. But here's, here's my opinion on it. It has to somehow become consistent on what's a foul and what's not a foul. And I don't know how you do that because at the end of the day, every game is officiated differently because every group of refs see things differently. And not, even just not groups, every individual ref sees the foul call differently. It's just, it's just the truth, and there has to be some form of consistency because NBA players don't know what's a foul or what's not a foul nowadays, and that's why you get the complaining on every single call. Anyway, this is a very, very big win for the Toronto Raptors on, on national TV. Um, I did a video on my main channel that will drop tomorrow where I was talking about the Raptors uh, quite a bit. They are they are way better than what they have performed this season, and they're starting to get production from like Aaron Baines, who was god-god awful for the first half of the season. And though Aaron Baines' production is just like setting hard screens and playing defense, that's what they need. That's what they need. And it's been successful, and they're going on this nice little streak, and it's, it's beautiful. Another game we want to talk about when it comes to officiating uh, was the Pelicans versus Pacers games because I, I saw a lot of Indiana Pacers fans hitting me up like, wasn't that a foul by Lonzo Ball? The answer, in my opinion, I guess we'll find out on a two-minute report tomorrow. I don't think that was a foul. That looked like the rule of verticality. And y'all know Ray Hibbert with the Indiana Pacers was that was his thing. So Lonzo Ball ended up doing it against the Pacers. And let's, today was the day of the Ball brothers, wasn't it? Lonzo stopped all of the bleeding from the Indiana Pacers bench, hitting, I think, four threes in the fourth quarter and the biggest one, and then getting that defensive stop. Two, two, no, 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 this last couple of weeks for Lonzo Ball has been really, really good. And, and again, like I said, stopping the bleeding because the Indiana Pacers went on this huge run with their bench unit. Uh, Aaron, uh, the Holiday Brothers, you know what I'm saying? It was Gogo Badazzi and everybody. They went on this huge, huge run to basically come back a game that I thought was pretty much over going into the fourth quarter. I need to stop doing this. Stop turning off games. But I, I did go back and rewatch this. He stopped the bleeding. Brandon Ingram hit a big shot here and there. But the big question I've been seeing is why didn't Nate Borkgren ended up putting his starters in on that last possession? Why was it four bench players and one Miles Turner and not Malcolm Brogdon, who's already hit a couple um couple game winners for them? Why not Sabonis, who's an all-star caliber player? And I understand your idea of putting them in the game because at the end of the day, if they're in the game, you get a better shot than what you got for Miles Turner, right? Even though the Miles Turner shot was close to going in, you probably get a better shot if it's Malcolm Brogdon or if it's Demontis Sabonis. And here's my opinion on probably what Nate, Nate wanted, to, wanted to do was grow trust with his bench unit to, to, because, honestly, as a bench player, there's like this probably this, this notion in your mind that no matter how good I play, at the end of the day, my starter is going to be in when it matters the most, right? But in this game, this bench players were out playing the starters, and he grew this trust in his bench unit that, like, if I am playing good as a bench player, no matter the circumstances, if I'm having a really good game, I can trust that I will be on the court when it matters the most. And I think that's kind of what it was. I think this is a long-term plan for Coach Nate. I think he's playing chess when everybody's playing checkers. Sure, they end up losing the game here. But at the end of the day, does this increase the confidence of Aaron Holiday? Does this increase the confidence of, of a, one of the backup bigs and Goga Badati? Probably to know that at the end of the day, Nate was, Nate was willing to let them be on the court even though they have guys like all-star guys and Sabonis and potentially Malcolm Brown. That, that's my opinion. I know that you want to win the, the game, but this may be a, a long-term plan uh, nonetheless. Another officiating game, the Bulls end up losing to the Orlando Magic. And this was, I'll, I'll qu quickly talk about this. The Bulls don't have a center on their roster right now because Wendell Carter's out with an injury and Daniel Gafford just ain't that right now in his year number two. Um, and anytime the Bulls will go against a skilled center, he's probably going to dominate. And <laughs> Nick Vucevic put on a, um, a very good performance. It's career high performance. For me as a Bulls fan, it was cool to see the little mini comeback that we ended up having. Unfortunately, it wasn't a win. Uh, Patrick Williams putting up 20 points for his first time in his NBA career. Super excited. 
exciting. But at the end of the day, we were missing Wendell Carter. Laurie Marketing got injured halfway through this. And then we were also missing Otto Porter. So I can't complain too much. A, a L does hurt always. But again, I can't complain too much. Uh, the next game that I actually got to watch, like I said, this was the day for the Ball Brothers. And LaMelo put up a 34-point game. Since he's been a starter, his his numbers are ridiculous. His shooting splits are ridiculous. The biggest question about LaMelo was can he hit the NBA 3 uh, through the first 20 or so games? Yep, he sure can. Now, they did end up losing this game because the uh, Utah Jazz don't miss three-pointers at all. But this is just such a promising thing when it comes to the Charlotte Hornets. Um, There's no way, there's no way that when, who was it, when... Uh, P.J. Wilson, P.J. Washington comes back to the lineup that LaMelo goes to the bench. Somebody else is, is getting benched, whether it be Terry Rozier, whether it be um, Vontae. Somebody's getting benched. This man has been playing way, way too well. And the best thing about it is not just the fact that he had, he had uh, 30, 34. He didn't turn the ball over at all. I know it's a lot to talk about a player that caught an L, but he's a rookie player, and he just had the best game of his career. Bogdanovich, remember when we talked about the Jazz, we were saying that Bogdanovich haven't put it together uh, the last couple weeks, last week and a half? Stellar. Stellar. This Utah Jazz team is hitting all-time numbers from the three-pointer. They have like five players on their roster shooting over 40% from three. Is that sustainable long-term? I don't know. I mean, it's it's 23 games into the season. It's not a hot streak, right? They got like five players shooting over 40% from three. That is ridiculous. Ridiculous, oh, especially on the volume that they're shooting. So big, big wins. Um, uh, I've spent a couple seconds on his. D'Angelo Russell hit a game winner today where Al Horford had his best game as an OKC Thunder. And then people on Twitter are trying to figure out what's next for Al Horford because um, he's playing good this year. But the only problem is he's got like a 2 plus 1 and 27 million. I know there are teams out there that could use center play, but not for this price. <laughs> not for that price. Good game from him. It took everything for the Timberwolves to win this one. There was no Shea Gibbs Alexander. They, I mean, the Thunder had like eight players total. <laughs> Lou Dort didn't play. You know what I'm saying? But it took every it took every single shot from the Timberwolves to get this win. But a win is a win. And then the last game, the one I stayed up for, it was a good game between the Celtics and the Clippers at the end of the day. But it was hard for me to be invested because there was no Paul George and no Jalen Brown. I'm happy I did watch it. But this is one of the games that I, I think Rusty Buckets on Twitter talked about it too. Where like, it could be a good game between two good teams and you literally don't have any takeaways. And I think that's, oh, the takeaway, Kimbo's cool. You know what I'm saying? Like, is that my take? Yeah, Kimbo Walker looked good today after starting off bad. That's my take. Like, it was just one of those games, man. It's just one of those games. Lou Williams also had a good performance. But that's it. That's it. If you enjoyed it, leave it a like. I'll see y'all soon, man. I, I will recommend follow me on socials if you want to keep up with what's going on behind the scenes to call game stuff because I do want to post a decent amount, whether it be on Instagram or Twitter of what's going on. Um, but that's it. I appreciate y'all. I'll see y'all soon. Peace.